So I'm with Julia Smith, who is an Uxbridge born and bred resident, lived on Montague Road all your life. I'm not going to ask exactly how old you are. That would be rude, wouldn't it? Well, I should probably say when I'm <laughs> 80 this year. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So um, maybe we can go right the way back to um, being born in the same house that you live in still. That's right. That's amazing. <laughs> Your house built around 1930 in Montague Road. So it did have inside toilets. Oh, yes, rather. <laughs> All the mod cons. All the mod cons. <laughs> and where did you go to school? Well, I went to school at uh, Belmont Road Infant School, which was on the corner of the bus station. Long departed, three classes, heated by open fires, toilets out in the playground. And then when you got to be seven, you had to move on to Whitehall Junior School, which is along Whitehall Road. And you stayed there until you were 11. I remember Belmont Road quite clearly. I mean, I already had a, quite a good knowledge of things because I had two older brothers and so I, t I used to sit at the table with them and do, in quotes, my homework when they did their homework. So. <laughs> <laughs> and can you remember what kind of games you would have played in the playground? I can't say I do particularly. I remember, of course, there was um, a brick-built bomb shelter was still there and there was no barrier on it but pain of death. You mustn't put a foot inside. So I never saw inside oh. <laughs> the bomb shelter, but it was still there. And the headmistress, Miss Moss, was a formidable lady who lived in uh, the last part of her life in Clare House and lived to 102. Gosh. And she was a great believer in slapping people. <laughs> <laughs> there was no, no regulation in those days. Slapping was the cure-all for everything. And the layout of the classroom, I suppose we're talking the lift-up wooden desks with the ink wells, or we... Yes. Yes. In the infants, it had a slot underneath. You know, you had the top and then you had a, a slot underneath where you could put things. Because I got into trouble because I took my teddy bear. Ah. And when I got into the third year, which I was seven-ish, that wasn't really... You didn't take your teddy bears. <laughs> no. <laughs> and were there many sort of remnants of the war... You can recall. Obviously, you mentioned a bomb shelter, but um, what else was around? Well, because in our road, nine people were killed in Montague Road before I was born. Yeah. And uh, there was some spaces there. Because the minute the war finished, they started burning what I always think of as the new houses. <laughs> because they're not so new now. But, uh, but say so nine of us, including a little girl, I was told, of course, who was in my brother's class, Iris, she was, of course, in school one day and, of course, was killed. The bomb went down on a Sunday. My parents weren't there because uh, we had in-laws who had a farm the other side of Windsor. And at the earlier part of the war, when I think people didn't really know what to do, they thought it would be a good idea to be out of Archbridge and near London. So they, mm. went, down to the, they went down to the farm. They'd have driven there in their, their well, car. My father didn't get married until he was, what, 31, 32. So during his bachelor days, he did have a car in the 20s. Oh, no, you could, cars were, had to be put up. You couldn't get petrol ah. unless you were on war work. The, the car was in the garage. OK. And my mother used to tell me, she used to take me into the garage when I was about two, two and a half, I suppose, and they'd say, when the war's finished, we'll go on picnics. <laughs> and I used to say, what's picnic? She used to tell me, well, no, you couldn't, unless you were on war work. My, my father used to cycle, because he worked in Uxbridge, he used to cycle from the other side of Windsor up into Uxbridge every day for work. Gosh. And an interesting, I must tell you probably quite an interesting bit, my maternal grandfather was in royal service for 57 years, his whole life, basically. So my brothers they used to go to Windsor Castle to have their baths, because he had during the war he had rooms at Windsor Castle and rooms at Buckingham Palace. OK. And they also went to the famous pantomime that the Queen and Princess Margaret were in. I say. So that was uh, <laughs> interesting. And I wasn't around. I was always a bit sorry. By the time I was any age to appreciate things like that, he had retired. He stayed on until he was well in his 70s. He was going to retire before the war because all the younger men went off to the war, so he stayed. Thinking about outside school, were you in the 
brownies or you at church or oh church church played an enormous St Margaret's Church yeah played an enormous part in my young life. Both my brothers were in the choir, and the younger one of the two, he was a soloist. His voice was so marvellous. They offered him a place to be in the St George's Chapel Windsor Choir because he had bad asthma. And in those days, I think probably now, they'd have thought it was a good idea for him to go away from home and live away. But in those days, it was considered perhaps, you know, better off at home. Ah. So he didn't go. Any sort of clubs or societies around outside well, school? Well, I used to go... <laughs> I have to say, I was asked on many occasions to join the Brownies, and not many people I haven't really disliked in my life, but I didn't like the lady who ran the Brownies, so I never joined the Brownies. And what can you remember from Uxbridge itself, maybe Uxbridge High Street? Because we're talking, obviously, pre the pavilions, oh, pre yes, the chimes... Yes, yes. Lots of individual owner-owned shops. Yes, well, I think there were suitors, of course. That was the sort of a big go-to. That was like the department store yeah. where JB Sports, I think, is now. Yeah. Miss that. Love suitors. Well, you could get everything, basically. Everything was in Uxbridge, mm. but small and simple. So um, is there any particular shops that you recall? Davies. Davies... Uh, Upstairs was the toy shop part, and downstairs, sort of almost like fancy goods. It wasn't that big mm. because my father used to take me to the fancy goods part. That's where I used to get the Christmas presents and birthday presents from my mother. But upstairs, you went up wooden stairs, and there was the toy shop, the dolls, and uh, the farm animals, and the soldiers. And I have to say, me having two older brothers, I was always a bit into soldiers, <laughs> the yeah. model soldiers. And whereabouts was Davies on the high street? Well, where is it now? Somewhere about where the library is, I suppose, really. Somewhere, yeah. somewhere about there. There was a fish shop, fresh fish, you know. Yeah. And there was a metal trough, and in it were live eels, which I was always fascinated by. By not realising that they were there <laughs> for the reason that they were there. Because they used to do the dirty deed out the back. You didn't see them killing them. But I used to be fascinated. I thought they were put there for my, you know, for my <laughs> amusement. <laughs> <laughs> and then were you into sort of music at all? Were there any record stores well, or, or books? Oh, always books. Mm. You couldn't have your own library ticket in my day until you were five. Right. But I had books out, of course, on my mother's or... Whoever. And you know the library was now where the civic centre is. Mm. You went upstairs. There was also the school dentist there, <laughs> right. which was a place you, <laughs> you sort of visited quite often. We didn't have all the snacks and sweet drinks and things that they've got now, so I didn't have any bad teeth when I was younger. No. When I got older, but not when I was young. And the people, I often say to people, we, we didn't have any cafes... I think there was one, there was a restaurant at the bottom, which is now the Nonna Rosa, but was called, what was it called in those days? The Fairy Bell. Okay. That was always there. Cafes? No, no cafes. Great excitement when a milk bar opened in Uxbridge. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> a milk bar? A milk bar. A coffee, what happened coffee in there? Bar. Okay. There was a milk bar as well. Because we used to go, my brother, when he was uh, had his leave, because he had to do national service, he used to take me to the milk bar, and that's how money was. He couldn't afford a milkshake each, so we used to share a milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> and that's opposite now, opposite Flora Fountains, but it was about there. And then cinemas, there's been quite a few cinemas in Oxford. Oh yes, three Uxbridge. cinemas. Yeah. The Regal at the top, which is now the nightclub. Yeah. The Savoy, which is now, well, I think they're closed, the bank, you know, on the corner of uh, Yeah, Vine and Street. And the Odeon, down the bottom. Yeah, where the gym is now. That's right. Yeah. And were you an avid cinema goer, or were people going more in those days? Tended to go more when I just started work in 1960. My mother and I, because my father died when I was still at school. So, of course, it was just her and I. We used to, we tended to go a bit more then. Yeah. And we used to go to the Odeon mainly because you could drive down there and there was a car park. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> we were the only people in our road for many years who had a car. Seems amazing now. Yeah. 
And my m- mother was always quite proud of the fact that she was a very early woman driver. After the war, when the cars came out again, my father was at work, and when he got home, she used to tell me, I said, oh, I'm tired, I want to go to bed. And he thought, well, what a shame, the car is stuck in the garage. So he taught her to drive in about 1947, which was quite unusual, A, for people to have a car, and B, for women to drive. Yeah. So all my friends at school, they tell me this now, because I've still got a friend or two I was at school with, they used to hope that they were sort of popular, because my mother used to take us out for picnics. <laughs> <laughs> we used to go to Gerard's Cross. You know Gerard's Cross? Yeah. Very, very countryfied in those days. Not like now. Okay. On, we used to go to on the green or something. On the green, oh, oh yeah. Do you recall the, the trolley buses and oh, the yes, trams? rather. When I started at um, the junior school, which was down, you know, down Whitehall Road, the tram rails were still there, but the trolley buses had started. And when I eventually went to Bishop's Hall, you went on the trolley bus. And it used to be very frustrating because you'd stand at the bus stop waiting for it to come, and you know they'd run on an overhead arm. And if the arm came off, <laughs> nothing could get past or at least no trolley buses could get past, chaps had to get out and get the long pole from underneath and try and hook it back on the electric. They've got one exactly like it in the London Transport Museum. Oh, wow. I've never been to the (laughs) the London (laughs) Transport Museum. What about some of the yards in Uxbridge? They were a bit of reputation, didn't they, in those days? Yeah, by the time I was around, the little houses and that down the yards, that was all gone. Yeah. But you could walk down the yards into the high street. Yeah. But the actual houses and that were gone. The one that remained, the one nearest Belmont Road, you could walk through there for many years and, um, what was the name of that place? Nor- uh, Vernon Browns. They were there. Yeah. So, sold hardware and um, various things. What about swimming? Because I hear stories yes. of people... Um, oh gosh, yeah, swimming. Did you go into the fray to swim? Uh, no, I never went. When we started at Bishop's Hall... We used to go swimming at the open air pool once a week. And because you either went at quarter to nine, which was the first lesson in the morning, or quarter past three, which was the last lesson in the afternoon. And because no coaches or anything, you just use public transport. And everybody used to keep their fingers crossed and hope they'd be the quarter past three because it was freezing cold, even at quarter past three. But at quarter to nine in the Ooh. morning, it was even worse sort of thing. This is the Lido Lindon Sports and Leisure yeah, now. Yeah, Sports and Leisure. Yeah. But the open pool that is there now, it looked, you know, exactly like that. That's funny. They just put some heating in, which is oh just God. shows us how oh. wimpy we are these days, oh doesn't gosh. it? Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because you know, there, was, there used to be a race. My brother wasn't into swimming, so but he had friends. They used to call it the Fustin Cup, and that was, I think, on Christmas Day. And they all went for a, a swim in the open air Lido on Christmas Day. Oh, crikey. And they, the one who won, it was the, called the Fustin, not the first, but the Fustin Cup. Mm, probably because you're so cold. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so Bishop's Hold, can you recall much of that? Oh. I mean, that's been there well, for years, isn't it? When we were there um, at Whitehall, in those days, there was, well, you can call it 11 plus, it was the scholarship. And you had the scholarship at 11, and you either went to Bishop's Hall, which was the grammar school, or you went to Uxbridge County School, or whatever they call it now, but it was the Greenway in those days, and that mm. was the secondary modern, and you went there. Yeah. Because I sort of grew up with two elder brothers at Bishop's Hall, and I sort of almost assumed that I would, would go, and because I was lucky, I suppose, I had a father who wanted always to be a teacher, but when his father died at 14, he started work in Ireland because he came from Ireland. So education was very much not pushed or forced, but it was just around. Yeah. You know, the fact that everybody was keen on education. My mother did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, because there, there were, should have been five of us. I was the last hope for a girl, four boys. But I grew up knowing that the two boys born before me had both died before the age of two. Gosh. So there was a big... They wouldn't die these days with antibiotics and everything, but they were just too early before mm. that was discovered. So my brother, Colin, was eight years older than me, and my brother, John, was 11. Mm. But they were always very good to me. I always say <laughs> how kind they were to me. I always say I went to Bishop's Hall, and I had two elder brothers, and I'd never heard a swear word. <laughs> 
<laughs> Nothing was ever, you know, never heard a swear word until I mm. was 11 ish. Then you got there and crikey. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they were quite good, actually. It was so academic there. Yeah. And there's stories of um, going down into the, into the cellars in, in Bishop's Holt. Well, I don't know how people got down because I never knew there were cellars. And about seven or eight years ago, because I always go to the reunion, yeah. Ken took a tour of us down in the cellars. And I never even knew <laughs> that there were cellars. I knew there was a, um, a space under the school, which I gather, you, I don't know what it was there for. Yeah. But I didn't ever know there were actual cellars, but I do now. And I say I've been round with Ken <laughs> showing. <laughs> and because as Ken said in a talk he gave to the History Society, when you got there at 11, it was quite a formidable place because all the staff wore black gowns and the discipline was was rigid. When I got to work and had a junior and I told her one or two things, she nearly fell about laughing. <laughs> And I said to my brother, because we both agree, nobody bullied anybody because you were so scared of what would happen to you. Because, mm. you know, there's sanctions and there are no sanctions these days. Anybody can just do yeah. what they like, basically. I've got to ask you about Squeaky the Chicken. Oh, well, yes, so that was um, in the war. I mean, I remember them, obviously. My parents kept bantams. Bantams? Bantams. That was the small chickens oh. and we had a, a, a wooden chicken shed with mm. a run and of course we had the bantams and then the eggs we had a cockerel too which was my father we had a particular cockerel my mother I can remember he was scared of it because it's very aggressive and in the run if you walk past it would run at the run <laughs> and sort of go mad because my father couldn't finish them, which is basically what happened in the end. He had a friend who had to come round. He was too <laughs> kind-hearted. He couldn't do anything like that. But the eggs, my mother, that's the thing I always remember, we had a green enamel bucket, and you put the eggs in a mixture of water and this stuff called icing glass, which was some sort of preservative. Put them in the larder, and they would last for, I don't know how long, but they would, la they would last, so you had eggs. Oh, wow. Because you hoped that they would be laid. And I've still got the little book at home somewhere. My brother Colin, the one that was eight years older than me, him, he kept a little book of how many eggs each day <laughs> and all that stuff. He loved them. There was this chicken that he was particularly fond of, Squeaky. And when it got ill, I mean, nobody would have thought about taking chickens or anything to vets and that, which perhaps these days you would have done. A, it wasn't done, and B, I suppose people just couldn't afford it. So yeah. poor Squeaky had to sort of, and my brother sat up with Squeaky all night, giving it little drops of brandy on a spoon, but of course poor Squeaky. <laughs> <laughs> we used to let them out in the garden. Now, I'm not sure to what extent chickens do fly or whether they'd been sort of pinned because they didn't go anywhere. Mm. They'd get up on the fence and sort of have a look round and sort of say, well, this is nice, but... Uh, they didn't fly off, but yes, Squeaky. Little did he know, what, 75 years on, I still remember yeah. <laughs> Squeaky. <laughs> Can you recall, obviously this bit later, the pavilions being built? Oh, and yes, then... I, I was at work then, and I always say I really didn't notice it happening because I went to London and you got on the train in the morning and then came home in the evening by which time you were tired and then at weekends my mother we used to go to either Windsor or Slough because mm. there's shopping in Uxbridge base you got all the basics but there was nothing fancy mm. so I, I really didn't sort of almost notice it in my brain I know Uxbridge is like it is now but sort of in my heart I can almost see it like you see all the pictures in in the books mm. <laughs> With the policeman at the uh, the policeman directing the traffic at the corner of the market house because there were so few cars and he just used to stand there with his hands and direct the traffic. And there was Burton's, wasn't oh, there? Burton's, yes. Well, now Burton's it was a dance hall, but I didn't ever go there as a dance. But you could have wedding receptions there. Ah. And I was a bridesmaid twice, once to my brother in one of the coaching inns, which are knocked down now, you know, along by where the library is. And the other one, they had the reception there at Burton's. And I'm still in touch. I was talking to them on the phone, the girl who was, I was bridesmaid to. She's 88 now, and her husband is 90. They live in Stafford. 
and he was talking to me. We were having a laugh because I used to go to St Margaret's Church with my parents before I could read, so I was about four-ish. And when it came to the sermon, one or other of my brother's friends, who were sort of 16, 17, used to take me out. And I think they used to enjoy that because they missed the sermon. And Fred was saying, oh, he said, I remember when I carried you up the street... <laughs> <laughs> in the sermon and I used to stand on the pews and because I couldn't read when they sang hymns I used to sing nursery rhymes yeah and there was um, a song that was very popular at the time called Bell Bottom Trousers Coat of Navy Blue and I used to stand on the pews and belt that out <laughs> okay why not <laughs> and then because eventually I, when I was five-ish we had a big Sunday school well that new building is now in Belmont Road mm. opposite the doctor's surgery yeah. There was the big hall there with a little subsidiary hall, which was like a wooden hut at the side, and you used to go at 2 o'clock every Sunday off to Sunday school. Okay. And when you'd done a year at Sunday school, you got a prayer book, and when you'd done two years, you got a Bible, both of which I've still got. And we used to go on coach trips, not often, but we used to go on a coach trip. And I stayed there until I was about 12, and I thought, oh, I'm getting too old for this. And the teacher of our little group, Miss Cottrell, she came to the house and she was most upset. <laughs> a, that I'd left, but most what most upset her, I hadn't told her first. Yeah. I just stopped going. <laughs> <laughs> what about the chimes being built? Do you remember that? I was obviously then, well, what was that? 60-ish, yeah. something like that. And it had a bit of a nuisance because um, it used to interfere with the television. Yeah. As the crane used to swing round, it would cause the television to sort of flicker about. Now, my friend who lived initially close, it used to change, she was nearer, it used to change stations. There again, by which time I'd given up work to look after my mother full time and I tended to only be, could be out of the house a very limited time, so I tended not to, you know, it just went on. Didn't mm. really hear, I was sufficiently far up Montague Road, it wasn't noisy, mm. but the cranes were a bit of a, you know, a bit of a nuisance. And I went to the opening day, because uh, they gave you balloons and everything. Who opened it? I can't remember. No. What was there before? Was it the brewery? As you go down George Street, you've got the health centre, haven't you? And then you come on to the entrance that the they, the doctors and that go in for their little car park and also the delivery place where they go in there. Mm. That was the, the Salvation Army Citadel, which was a great uh, a sort of pleasure to me because it had walls with a space for you, obviously, to walk up the steps to go in. And it had a wall, and my favourite thing was, holding my mother's hand, was to walk along the wall, because mm. it was just a nice height. They used to march with the band up Montague Road, and they used to have their Sunday service at the junction of Grove Road and Montague Road. I don't know whether you know, but I mean, they, could, they were in the road. You wouldn't do that these days. No. And then they used to march back to the Citadel playing, the band playing, and I always used to make sure I was out in the front to see the band go by. Yeah. That was quite exciting. <laughs> and like <laughs> little ones used to sort of run behind the band. And then opposite there was the house. I don't know whether he was the manager of Harmon's. My friend Ian Sawyer, his name was. His dad, they lived there. Lower down to that, there was a blacksmith's. Okay. A little blacksmith, a man on his own, and our front gate, because we had such a narrow road and it was such a job to get in and out with the car, we had our front widened and we had gates made at the blacksmiths. So travelling on the, on the underground or on the trains to get into town... On the underground, yeah. You would have been... The smoking would have been allowed. Oh, yes. I used to try and avoid it if I possibly could. Yeah. But if there was a choice of standing a long way or sitting in a smoky carriage I would get in the smoker but I mean basically I would choose to get in the non-smoker yeah and occasionally when I first started we used to have these old trains they used to call them rock and roll because they weren't particularly you know they did rock and, roll. and occasionally which was rather a novelty we would have a corridor train mm. come into Uxbridge can you remember the um because you had um, Fastenage Park obviously yeah. Then the road was built through well, the, the dual carriageway. I always got a bit funny enough. I was in a book I was looking at. Perhaps I was talking to Ken. Anyone went past the cinema 
right, the, the Odeon yeah. that was there, you turn to the left and you could go along the canal and there was still a mill. Oh. And you could see the chaps that we usually went on a Sunday when they weren't working, but you could see all the hooks and all the gubbing where they, you know, lifted up and down the, the flower and everything. Oh, wow. That all got filled in. That used to be one of our favourite walks. If you walked down there not very far, you ended up in Passage Park. Yeah. But it's so, it's so different now. When I finished one, my big interest was railways, model railways. Ah. And I saw the little boy who used to live next door and who's now 50. They had me over for a meal at Christmas. He used to treat my mother as his grandmother, basically, because he hadn't got grandmother. And he brought in his electric train set after Christmas one year and set it up on our table. And, of course, I was the one who got hooked. He went on to computers and girls and that left me still very keen on trains. And because when I had my mother, I could read the magazines and that, but I couldn't go anywhere because the minute I didn't have her, I could go to, you know, I belong to the Great Western Railway Preservation Society. Do you have any model railway at home? Well, I've got some stuff which I used to have in the spare bedroom, but it's all packed in boxes now. Mm. I used to go to Northolt until, well, until the pandemic started. I used to go to Northolt. They used to have it at the community centre. And I used to go to the ones in London where I saw, though I didn't realise the significance at the time, the Reverend Audrey, who was the chappie who wrote the Thomas the Tank Engine book. Mm. Oh, and of course, the WI became my big thing for, well, still in the WI, but Uxbridge WI, packed uh-huh. up. If you can't get somebody to do the officer's jobs, you have to finish. Uh-huh. And we couldn't get anybody to be the treasurer. I have to say... 19 years I was the president of Archbridge. <laughs> I miss it. So you can make jams. I could, hey, well, I think it depends to a certain extent on the president, so I could decide. We had a programme of speakers because I like going out, so we used to belong to Hellenden Community Transport, which mm. you've probably heard of. Yes. Communi- and so I used to just ring up and say, we want to go so-and-so, and they, if they had a van with a volunteer driver... Off we used to go. <laughs> so I've been to a good few places. And then when I didn't have my mother, my biggest pleasure was to go to London and go to all the museums and art galleries and exhibitions. I miss it now because I don't think I couldn't manage the escalators and mm. things like that. So that's a big disappointment. Yeah. One of the disadvantages were getting old. <laughs> were you into sort of music and things and, and the arts in those days? Yeah. Art, yeah. Yeah. Having the two elder brothers, we had um, a very early record player where you had the, the metal, you know, you had the the, the needle. It, it was a real needle. Yeah. So I, there wasn't pop music as such. All this sort of youth culture. And me, there were no clothes for young people. You just wore scaled-down versions of what the adults wore. Yeah. No pop, no youth culture. <laughs> no, it's interesting, isn't no, it? No, no use culture at all. It just about started, I suppose, well, late 50s, early 60s, I suppose. Mm. But no, there was no clothes for youngsters and nothing like that. Can you recall what music we, you were interested in in those times? Well, because there wasn't pop as such, and two older brothers, both of whom were mad on classical, mm. it was rather, it was sort of classic, <laughs> classical. Yeah. Piano, particularly, because oh. my brother was so much into the piano, so we used to have Gili, who was my hero, and my we, we kept my brother and I kept Gili as our hero. He was a tenor. You probably don't, you know, you may not know, because no. it, it's history. To you. He was a tenor, and then fairly recently, my brother said to me, "Oh, I think now, I think that Pavarotti. I think I've gone over to Pavarotti." And I said, traitor, I'm still with <laughs> And Maria Callas. Yeah. But you're in the um, Uxbridge Local History Society yeah. with, with, with Ken and yeah. everybody. Yeah. Still having all the talks and things. About 17 or 18 years, I suppose. Mm. As soon as my mother died, because when I had my mother, I couldn't go out and about. So yeah. as soon as... I did say I didn't want to go out in the evening. Not because I'm nervous. I've got friends who don't want to go out in the evening because they're nervous. But uh, one of the first things I joined for was the coach trips. Because <laughs> <laughs> we used to go on coach trips, which we don't do now. But we used to go on coach trips too. Stately homes and things like that. Yeah. Oh, my sister too. That's one thing about... Because a lot of people don't know about Vine Street Station. 
we didn't ever go on it very rarely because we got the car. But uh, when my brother, my second oldest brother, was killed in a motorbike accident, everything was done to try and well, cheer me, basically. There was no, no, no such thing as counselling and all that in those days. You had your parents, sort of thing. And we had a puppy, and he came up on the train from Wales. He was a Welsh corgi, and he was Welsh. And I remember going down to Vine Street Station and speaking, we did, to the, the guard, and he said, uh, oh, yes, he's in the guards van, and he's been making a noise, and there was this little puppy <laughs> barking <laughs> away. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so the Vine Street train went down to... Went to West Drayton. West Drayton, yeah. Obviously, it's not there now. Stopped but. at Cowley and then went to West Drayton. Mm. And my mother used to come in. She used to work in London initially before she got married and go on the main line. And then, of course, she worked in Uxbridge. As I said, my parents met at the post office. The facade is still there. As you know, they had to keep the facade. But that's where they met. She was a telephonist and he was... Um, well, he was out, they called me leaving. He was acting as postmaster to a little local branch. And he spoke to on the phone and he said, oh, I don't like your voice. When oh. I come back to Archbridge, I'm going to come and see you, which he did. Wow. <laughs> and in those days, there were so few people. Every time a, a call came in, you made a little note of the number. I think there were about 100 people on the telephone in the Archbridge area. <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> did you have a phone? In those early oh, days? we did. We had a phone for a sad reason. We didn't have one. When my brother had his motorbike accident, he was in hospital for a week and my father pulled strings to get a telephone installed so that he could keep ringing the hospital to see how he was getting on, which was 1952. Nobody had a telephone. Friends and neighbours used to come to the door and say, can we use your telephone? We used to say, oh, yes. And they used to leave, I don't know what it was, couple of old pennies or something like that yeah. to use our telephone. Seems amazing now. Yeah. There was a telephone box around on, well, you wouldn't call it the green now, but sit the gardener's arms, you know, the gardener's arms. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was a telephone box there, but they used to say, come and come and use yours, and we used to say, oh, yes. So that <laughs> was, seems amazing, doesn't it? On the trains, there was also Uxbridge High Street. I never went on it. The idea was, I expect you've read one of the books about it, the idea was that they were going to have a main line from Uxbridge out to, I don't know, out into Buckinghamshire, but of course the war came and it never came to fruition. Mm. I don't know, Ken would know, whether they actually did uh, passengers from there, but they certainly did freight, yeah. and they did freight from there up until it, you know, it, it packed up sort of thing. Mm. I and mean, you could drive down, um, well, of course you can't drive down now because it's all blocked at the end, but you could drive down past and of course you'd look up and you could see the height of the station above you because it was, it was a butt, it was risen up because the idea was it would come on a, a bridge across the high street. Okay. So you can't go down there now anyway. So. No. <laughs> That's where the, um, I think it's part of the Buckinghamshire uh, University. It's the yeah. nurses place mm, that makes sense i suppose you remember sanderson's big factory i never had occasion to go there sanderson's fabrics always considered to be you know top drawer yeah sold in randall's because you oh, know randall's, randall's of course yeah we haven't mentioned randall's oh, haven't no, we randall's over there my mother knew, I said to John Randall, I think it must have been your dad, she sort of knew he was there sometimes because they had a toy department, mm. which in the later years they didn't have a toy department. So we always had to go to the toy department. And that was, I think, John Randall's dad. He was sort of pottering about. And my mother and I used to have a, you know, and him used to have a, you know, sort of chat. Did you notice these things when you were young? Mm. Well, I've got to tell you about the Royal Garden Party. Royal Garden Ooh, Party? Oh, I went to a Royal Garden Party. Oh, tell me about that. Well, I'm sure <laughs> to tell you about that. Yeah, how did that come about? Well, I didn't know, but I ran another... I ran the Uxbridge WI, and I ran another group, a mixed group, in Cowley. And behind my back, when we had the thing with John Randall, one of them went up to John Randall and said, how do you go about getting a... This is what was, I was told afterwards. How do you go about getting a medal for somebody? And he said, oh, you get a lot of forms. I'll send the forms to you. And then he said, well, if they don't get a medal, they, if they've been recommended, they'll certainly get an invitation to a Royal Garden Party. Oh, I see. So 
five years ago, six years ago, this envelope came th- about November time. This envelope came through the door. Nothing very fancy. And I think it said, uh, yeah, I've got it all at home, the office of the Lord Lieutenant or something. Yeah. And it said, you have been recommended, you know, to go to a rock garden party and you can bring one person, obviously, if it's husband and wife, well, then they've got their husband and wife. But I said to my brother, are you coming? And it was a bit much in those days, so my niece came. And we came out of the station, all in our finery, and the chap that was sending the newspapers, he said, that way to the palace, and he went like this. Of course, I knew where the palace was. And you were given the choice of going in the front entrance or going in at the garden entrance at the bottom. And I said, I want to go in the front. (laughs) I mean, I'd been in the, you know, you can go on a tour of... Uh, Buckingham Palace but you don't go in the front entrance and you go in the sideway I said oh no I want to walk under the the arch bit so we did and then uh, you go at three uh, they've got um, marquees set up and the cakes the little cakes I've got the thing at home somewhere had little crowns (laughs) on the top (laughs) and then after an hour when you had your sort of food and that the Queen came oh wow and she came down with the Duke of Edinburgh and I think Prince Andrew, certainly Princess Alexandra, who was very ordinary, sort of potted about and didn't make any sort of fuss, they paid the national anthem. And then you could walk around the garden and see everything in the garden. And then it finished about sixes. I know my niece and I, we stood on the upper bits of them. We looked out over and we couldn't believe we were standing there, really. <laughs> And we had some chaps in all their uniforms and ladies in their African gear, and uh, that was a thing. Well, thanks, Julia. You're welcome back any time. Put the coffee on. Right, well, that's quite interesting. There's Julia Smith reminiscing about her time growing up and living 80 years in Uxbridge. <laughs> 